Hello, and welcome to um, our tech talk on improving the world one airship at a time. I'm David Morgenthaler, uh, the host, and I'd like to introduce Jeff Klagenberg, who I've known for many years. Um, we play darts together, it's kind of ironic, uh, balloons and darts. But uh, uh, Jeff and I worked together at a little company called Reasoning, um, where he was uh, my director of uh, product management. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's worked at several aerospace companies and uh, startups here in Silicon Valley. And he's now the president and CEO of General Orbital. And he's here to talk a little bit about their technology and what they're doing. So without further ado, take it away, Jeff. Thank you. So one thing I want to say about this talk and about me in terms of presenting, I really would rather have this not be so much a tech talk as a tech conversation. It means I can already tell there's a number of people here who have background uh, in some of the technologies I'll be talking about. And it's just the nature of this hype of technologies we're discussing that most people have had some exposure to it and therefore it should be more interactive. So in this talk, I'm going to break, you know, I'm trying to have the conversation in a controlled fashion. I fully expect we'll deviate from this agenda. And I'll probably be talking with you guys for about, you know, 35, 40 minutes. Uh, I'll do a short introduction to myself uh, and the technology. Um, but first, I'll talk about a comparative technology that we're all familiar with uh, that's benefited. Uh, I think all this pretty dramatically. Uh, I'll also talk a very, very brief history of, of airships and understanding the stratosphere, which is where this particular uh, set of vehicles is targeted at. Um, and then, of course, I'll talk a lot about how, how these airships can truly improve the world. Uh, and that's not an idle comment. That's truly a technology that can help uh, you know, reach many people throughout the world and, uh, you know, add a lot of capabilities that we need at home. And finally, I'll talk about the tech, the tech challenges that we're currently facing, I'll give you a little insight into kind of the different things that we're doing and why now that this is possible and people have been looking at doing this for a while. I decided not to put a whole lot of slides here. Um, so as as David had said, I'm Jeff Klagenberg. Uh, I was asked to be the CEO of, of General Orbital with a couple friends of mine that had started up. Uh, one named Dr. Alfred Differ that had worked on a lot of experimental balloon projects on a very, very tight budget. Uh, the technology we're talking about are high altitude airships. So these are airships that are targeted not the, the blimps that you're used to seeing, but at very high altitudes, specifically stratospheric altitudes. Uh, and one of the beauties of working on airships is there's such a romantic interest throughout society in airships. Um, but it's also a downside because there's very fanciful ideas about airships as well. And so we'll talk about that. There's very practical and pragmatic things about airships that make them wonderful products, and there's some really bears of challenges uh, in making them work, which is why they haven't been so far. So that technology I was going to talk to you about is satellites. You know, I, I certainly grew up in the, the space generation as a space nut. I know there's at least a couple here as well. Um, and satellites have truly improved our lives, uh, whether you really appreciate that or not. Um, people have examples of satellites and how, you know, how you use them today. Anybody out there use the satellite today? Anyone? GPS. There you go. GPS. Oh yeah. So, so the gentleman over there, uh, you know, had you know used his GPS unit today, uh, and certainly that that's one way satellites improved. Um, anyone make an international phone call? Did anyone, you know, actually, well, those aren't typically done by satellites, but the, the, the baseline communications that have been put out there um, have, you know, been enhanced by uh, satellites. To be fair, satellites in terms of international communications largely been TV and broadcast, not, 
radio and TV. XM radio, anyone have an XM out there? Uh, anyone go to Google Earth and use some of the stuff from Landsat data? Weather forecasting. Weather forecasting. So here, here's a quick pictorial guide to the satellites. That's a picture of our, of our Earth with satellites that are out there today uh, being depicted. Uh, it reminds me of a, another graphic I've seen not too far away from here. Um, but in this case, I like this graphic because it also shows that there's two major domains where satellites exist. If you notice, the, the, the white dots up here are very close to the Earth, and then you have the ring outside. And of course, the, the ring outside is where you have you know, geostationary satellites and the ring inside the low flyers that have different capabilities. By the way, has anyone here had an aerospace background or worked with satellites personally? OK, a few. I kind of got the feeling. Uh, a lot of the background that I had, as David indicated, I worked for a number of years at Lockheed supporting satellites and satellite projects. Um, just as an example, uh, you know, not all satellites or communication are truly geos geosynchronous. Uh, in this case, XM uh, uses a geostationary satellite and Sirius does not. Uh, but they're both high flyers. They're both very, very far away from the Earth. Sirius basically is targeting a higher latitude, which is the only reason that they need to go in a non-geosynchronous orbit. Conversely, if you look at satellites, this is, by the way, the track of the satellite that was recently intercepted, <laughs> um, that was going to burn into the, into the atmosphere. This is your typical low flyer uh, environmental satellite, spy satellite, um, that travels not only very close to the Earth, but typically in a polar orbit. And that allows it to cover the entire Earth as uh, the Earth spins underneath, it gets each time a different path of the Earth. Uh, very, very valuable, uh, and I'm definitely glad that those exist. And this gives you an idea of all the satellites in geostationary orbit and how crowded that orbit's getting, um, particularly over, you know, say, over North America. <laughs> and finally, just a reminder that all of these vehicles actually had to get up there. These vehicles are, of course, very valuable. They have a lot of power. They're expensive not only to build, but also to launch. Um, a given satellite can cost tens of millions, hundreds of millions, even a, you know, upwards of a billion dollars. And launches, similarly, if you start looking at geosynchronous orbits, can be similar. So I'm going to focus on two, the two categories of satellites I've just been talking about, geostationary, these are largely communication satellites. There are some weather satellites that are geostationary. They're 22,000 miles away. That's long enough that light time delay becomes an issue. It's why they're traditionally not used so much in, in uh, telephone calls. Uh, if you've ever made a satellite call, which I have, you can notice the time delay, about half a second usually, depends on your geometry. Um, and of course, if you're ever trying to pass data over those sorts of, of distances, it becomes a, you know, becomes a really uh, a painful problem. And then conversely, for your spy satellites out there, for your weather, your typical weather satellites that are getting very close data, they're close to the Earth, 100 miles, 200 miles, but 200 miles more normally, 100 miles, you're going to burn in pretty quick. These satellites have very high resolution because they're close to the Earth, but they're orbiting about every 90 minutes. So any given point on the Earth, they're over it for a fraction of time. So if it goes directly overhead, that satellite will be up for about 10 minutes. How many people here have seen the show 24? Do you remember scenes in there where they would be getting a satellite feed and they'd be watching a car? It, that doesn't happen. The reason it doesn't happen is by the time you call up, the car is gone, right? You, you've, you've passed over that. Unless you know the car is going to be there, the time it set, takes to set up that satellite feed, you're, you're just out of luck. Or unless you had 
enough satellites that you actually could cover the entire Earth, but that's several hundred satellites. Yeah. So that sort of capability actually doesn't exist. Now, the funny thing is people would like it to. If you have an oil pipeline, if you have a shipping lane, a port, you would really like that kind of capability. Now, there's other satellites, which I, of course, didn't mention, which ironically was, came up as an example, things like GPS, um, you know, astronomical observation, other things that all have had, uh, you know, significant impacts on us, but they're in slightly different orbits than that for a different reason. But those are the two primary orbits. So the trade-off between the orbits, geostationary, you're a long ways away if you're doing any observation, low resolution, have a huge footprint of the Earth. You can see, you know, quarter to a third of the Earth at a time. So that's why it's, it's a good ch choice for relaying signals. Uh, but you have the, the time delay in talking to it. Low Earth orbit satellites, very good resolution, but you're very, you're over any given uh, area in a very short amount of time. So I just want to give you that as a basis, right, so that you understand how we've leveraged those capabilities. And you're going to leverage similar capabilities with airships, but with more flexibility and more importantly, at price points which allow you to extend this to far more people in the world. Balloons. I, you, you could do several tech talks on balloons. They, they seem simple. They seem wonderful. The concept behind a balloon touches something in all of us because it's, it goes back to floating in a pool, right, or, or just being a kid. It, you capture enough light gas, you float. To give you an idea, the first flight of both uh, a hydrogen balloon and a hot air balloon happened in 1783, 225 years ago. We've leveraged this technology in many ways that a lot of people don't appreciate um, or, or know. But that's when it started. Then, you know, at that point, you would fly your left to the wind a lot, you know, which is a very enjoyable flight, by the way, and I recommend it. <laughs> but in 1886, you had the first person add a gas-powered engine to a balloon. Now, you could argue that's the first airship, right? That that's the first time that you went from something that floats with the wind to being controllable. And that was certainly the objective. Um, but given the strength of wind versus the strength of that engine, you'll find it's a nice objective, but not quite where you're at. 1900 was the first flight by the LZ-1 uh, built by Zeppelin in Germany. This you know, truly marked a point where you went from a balloon, effectively a, a lifeboat, to building a ship that would go through the air um, and started a, a wonderful um, time frame or time period in the airship industries. And by 1937, you had many people going across the Atlantic in airships. I mean, it, it was a, a very pleasant way to travel, very elegant way to travel. Uh, and of course, 1937, uh, unfortunately, the Hindenburg uh, caught fire and it, that and the advent of commercial aircraft suddenly made uh, airships you know, less valuable for personal travel. As a side note, for those who haven't seen the Discovery Channel or the Mythbusters coverage of the Hindenburg, I highly recommend it because one of the things that comes out of studying all the information now is it turns out the initial, uh, the initial um, fire with the Hindenburg was not a hydrogen fire. It started on the actual surface of the, of the ship. They had coated the canvas with a reflective coating to control temperature. It just so happened that the metals that they used to make that coating were aluminum and iron. And as we know now, that is a mixture known as rocket fuel. It's actually used in the same mixtures, or similar mixtures used in the solid rocket motors for the shuttle. So if you watch the video, it 
it, as soon as I understood what happened, it clicks. If you watch the video, the, the entire skin burns from top to bottom. If it had been a hydrogen fire, it would have never reached the bottom because as soon as the top started burning, it would have burned off. It, the skin itself was very, very flammable and was most likely the source of the fire. Any questions? Nothing? <laughs> Tomatoes? You didn't give them any fruit or anything, did you? No, food's free. Uh, that's true. Um, so, as I said, one of the, the interesting things to me about airships is airships are still being used, right? The, the, there's this kind of perception that the Hindenburg killed airships, and it didn't. And even if the Hindenburg hadn't happened, airships for personal transport probably would have died because airplanes were much faster and were less expensive than, than a, eventually became less expensive than a ticket on the Hindenburg would be. So the Hindenburg would have been a pleasure, you know, a pleasure craft, that sort of thing, and probably would still, you know, still fill that niche, but be much fewer people, much smaller uh, market. But airships today are still being lured. So, so here it's actually the Hindenburg. Uh, so an example is for scientific research. If you want to explore the tops of trees and you don't want to, say, disturb <laughs> them with like an ultralight and you want to hover and take, uh, take measurements, an airship is a very powerful and very good way to go. And it's, it is used in that sort of mode. And of course, you know, we're familiar with advertising, with football games, uh, ironically, observational usage. That's the same thing as a spy satellite, right? Taking pictures of the ground from, from an airship for a particular purpose, in this case, entertainment. Um, on the plus side, Airships have very quiet, quiet flights, which can be important. They have very, very heavy lift at very cheap power expenditures. By using buoyant lift, if you need to lift something very heavy a short amount of distance, it can be very effective uh, to do this. And it's interesting, there's a number of companies that have tried to do this and not quite made it. Uh, cargo lifters was uh, uh, an example <laughs> A very sad example not too long ago that had looked promising but didn't quite make it. Uh, there's projects to lift uh, lumber and various other, uh, you know, shorter haul uh, heavy lift things. But if you're dealing with airships, they're slow. Again, that's really what probably killed them in terms of air travel. And they're very vulnerable to the wind. How many people here are familiar with the story of the Macon and the Akron? Okay, so they, they were uh, airships that were posted on the Pacific coast. As a matter of fact, uh, you probably have seen a hangar you know, not too far from here. Um, and that was used to, to house uh, those two airships. Um, and they were ideal for patrolling the Pacific waters because they could move slowly and it would give you the time to really observe and see if there was anything in the waters, watch for uh, submarines and other, you know, other potential intrusions. Both of them went down in storms. The problem is they're very vulnerable to wind. You are big as an airship and you're light. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be up there. Uh, you have a lot of inertia, but you're still very, you know, very vulnerable to the wind. So winds start to blow and you're going to be going off course. And the bottom line is in our atmosphere, you know, wind happens, right? It's a, it's a very volatile place, the atmosphere close to the earth. So as I told you, we're not aiming our airships, or the, what I'll be calling EOSATs in just a little bit, we're not aiming at operating close to the Earth like most airships do currently. We're aiming at operating them in the stratosphere. There's a few reasons for that. The first of all is, as a, as a satellite, as you get higher and higher in altitude, you get to see more and more of the Earth. And the more and more of the Earth that you can see for communications or even for observation purposes, it's very valuable. So the stratosphere is at a, a nice altitude. I mean, you're looking 
depending on what units you want, 13 miles up, 17, 17 kilometers to 50, to 50 kilometers up, uh, you're high enough that you actually have a, a fairly large footprint. Um, and of course, you have enough atmosphere there. It, believe me, you don't want to go outside. But it's enough atmosphere there that you can still fly an airship. Uh, you can f fly balloons up to you know, upwards of 100,000 feet. You're getting dicey. You definitely have a lot less payload at those sorts of altitudes. But if you're looking at, say, you know, uh, 70,000 feet or so, you're going to have enough atmosphere that you can hold a decent payload. Most importantly, low wind speed. It seems perverse, and I'll show you a, a diagram of the wind speeds based on altitude, but the wind speeds in the stratosphere are low after you get through the jet stream. The low end of the stratosphere, you know, you, you're probably, you know, you're gonna have to be careful with, but once you're out of the jet stream, the wind speeds, the average wind speeds drop pr precipitously, and that's an important regime to take advantage of. And that's why pretty much all high altitude uh, airships have aimed at this target altitude, and that's the primary reason. But it's not a very pleasant environment. <laughs> you're looking temperatures minus 30 degrees, minus 40 degrees Celsius, you're really gonna challenge a lot of, a lot of your uh, electronics, a lot of your controls, and certainly if you're ever going to bring people up there, you're going to have to, you know, come up with a very comfortable way to hold them. Also, not much atmosphere. Uh, close enough to a vacuum, it's going to be a problem for electronics again uh, if you don't condition them or you have, haven't used the right electronics. Uh, most of what we'll be doing is having uh, areas that will have pressure in them so that uh, we can use more off-the-shelf electronics. And another kind of interesting thing is it just so happens the stratosphere is where the ozone is. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you ever look at a heat profile, which we will, one thing that's weird about the ozone is as you go up, it gets warmer. And that's because that's where the ultraviolet hits the ozone first and it's warming it up. So for research, it can be very useful. For people, again, electronics, you have to be careful. So this is what I'm talking about in terms of, of wind speed. So this is a, uh, a graph showing the speed of wind in knots versus the altitude. And I've highlighted where the stratosphere is. It actually goes a little bit higher than this. This is the region that you want to have airships fly in. It happens to be right around 70,000 feet. Um, and if you fly there, you can actually Bring up enough power to maintain your station. If you start flying in here in the jet stream, you're pretty much hosed. And you could probably get away with the winds up to 20 knots, but you know, the higher you go in altitude, the less, less you're going to be able to carry. So how consistent is this? I mean, the jet stream moves around. Um, it, it's relatively consistent with density of air. So if you build a vehicle to fly at a certain density of air around it, uh, you will move up and down, uh, but you're probably going to be okay. And it also depends on how close to this barrier you are. The closer you are to the barrier, the more, uh, the less consi or the less um, stable it is. The more you go up, the more stable it is because there's less for the air aim. You don't have the geography of the Earth. Uh, you do have to worry about hot zones. A hurricane, for example, would push the atmosphere up. Uh, but you're still able to, it's a manageable sort of thing. You're probably going to have to, at times, go off of station up to a kilometer, which might sound like a lot, but you're talking a fraction of a degree, right? So in terms of communications and in terms of uh, observation, it's not so bad. Sure. Uh, the sorts of resolution you could get, uh, you know, it, it depends on the equipment you take up, right? It's because it's going to depend on your optical resolution and whatever resolution of the sensing equipment you have on the other end of it. Uh, right, with current technology, well, the best thing to think about is it's like any other aerial photography system, uh, and you'll be able to get the same. You could actually see people um, and 
you know, I don't know the most cutting edge technologies out there in terms of uh, capturing images. I'm you know, sure that there are organizations that do that. Um, you know, but if you were talking, you know, you'd probably be talking license plate reading sort of scales are, are feasible. Uh, you'll, you'll always hear stories about reading somebody's newspaper. I don't think that would be very realistic. But certainly identifying people, or identifying that it's a person, not that it's a particular person, would be very doable. Uh, a lot of the images, the high resolution images you have on Google Earth, uh, as, as I was talking to David, are um, the high resolution ones tend to be more uh, aerial photography, and it's that sort of resolution you would get, right? Um, but you're always going to get better resolution at this altitude, say 13 miles, as opposed to a traditional spy satellite at 150 miles, because resolution is largely dependent on distance and equipment. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions about this? The stratosphere, the airships? Yeah, so this is the average uh, wind speed. So right. What is the standard deviation? Right, so, so how, what's the standard deviation of the wind speed as opposed, you know, it's actually a similar question as before. Um, I don't have a plot of that, but you're talking at wind speeds typically peaking in the stratosphere at, at that altitude of 20 knots and then, you know, on average 10 knots. So, you know, it's not, again, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly friendly altitude, the caveat being it's weather dependent, right, because there are events that will push, you know, that will push the layers of the atmosphere up and you're going to have to go with them. The nice thing is when you build a balloon, it stays at a constant density of air, right, so those densities of air are kind of what define the layers, so you tend to go up or down with that movement. There'll be more on that, by the way, in the tech challenges. Uh, this is the plot I just wanted to show you because it highlights really the fact that the ozone is there. If you look at the stratosphere, most of the atmosphere gets colder, colder, colder as you get out. That's because you have less air around you to retain the warmth, less air above you to keep the warmth in. It's being radiated out. But as soon as you get into the stratosphere, you'll notice it takes off in the other direction slightly. It almost gets to the freezing point of water. Uh, and in that is because you have the ozone and it's heating from the top down from the absorption of the ultraviolet. So as you're there, if you start going up, you realize you're exposing yourself to more ultraviolet and you do have to worry about how the ozone is going to affect your materials. How much uh, variation between day and night? How much variation is there the diurnal cycle, the day-night cycle? Um, in terms of the temperature, the ambient temperature doesn't change that much. The temperature of your vehicle will change dramatically. Uh, and part of that's because of the thinner atmosphere, you're, you aren't going to be able to stabilize your temperature as well. So when you're exposed to the uh, sun, you're going to heat up. It's much, it's much like being at orbit. Um, so you have to, to deal with that cycle. And that's actually one of the key tech, tech challenges to staying up there. Ways around that are you can either super pressurize your balloon, which means it keeps constant volume. So when you heat up, you know, you're, you're not going to tend to make yourself less or more, more dense, right? So you have a, the constant volume, you just have more pressure in there. Uh, and that keeps you from sinking, uh, going up and down as much, but it's a more complex product to build. Uh, as a matter of fact, the ultra, if there are, um, a, there is a NASA project out there called the Ultra, ultra Long Duration Balloon, uh, ULDB, and it's designed around a 100 day life cycle and it's a super pressurized balloon. Okay, so all of this talk so far, hopefully, you know, I haven't bored you too much, has been background for what we call the EOS, EOS SAT. And EOS just stands for Edge of Space instead of Earth Orbiting Satellite. Uh, edge of Space Satellite. And the question is, how will these improve the world? So this is kind of the bed, bread and butter of what I'm talking about. So we're talking about using inflatable technology, uh, technologies, like I said, that uh, can go up to 100,000 feet. Uh, vehicles long, uh, capable of long duration flight. 
but we're using off-the-shelf components. There's nothing in terms of our technology. The, the funny thing is when was, David asked me to do a tech talk at Google, I was saying, well, what's the cutting edge technology? And it's not. Specifically, it would fail if it was for balloons because you need to use reliable technologies and you need to use the stuff that exists. What's different is we have some specific techniques for dealing with some key issues around flight duration. And material science has created some products for us and everyone that have started to make uh, solar cells lighter and to, to make uh, the structure lighter so that you can get more up there. So here's a picture that is actually not quite accurate of our vehicle. This was a vehicle we had designed uh, for a different project where it was, this was a project that Alfred Differ worked on uh, to potentially launch a vehicle from altitude. So it's got an open area in the middle, specifically designed so it can support a large structure so it would actually hang a canopy underneath that would have a, a traditional launch vehicle uh, that would then drop from it. It didn't actually fire through it. It's a nice thought, but <laughs> uh, you would lose the vehicle. But, uh, but to actually carry the vehicle is there. Uh, and that's not there in the, in the current design. But it's a high altitude, unmanned ship. Right, if you're going to fly for a long time, you don't want people up there. 13-mile uh, flight, we're designing it around three months on station. That's pretty aggressive. We're confident we can hit the three months on station, which is actually very similar to the ULDB work. Um, and uh, with an operation concept, you know, three months will work fine. An important thing, so it would use as a communication platform and an observation platform just like a satellite would, but a key difference is the projected price on this, again, laying out the designs we already have, we're looking at a retail price of around 10 million per vehicle. Um, and of course, as we go and optimize our, our products, we'll try and make it cheaper. But the price is very important because this puts it in the reach of municipalities, it puts it in the reach of states, it puts it in the reach of even large corporations, making it possible for more people to get access to the sort of capabilities we're talking about. So as you can imagine, you know, some large corporations will have assets at risk, they'll have ships at risk, so they're interested in protecting them. If you're looking at rolling out communication services to, say, Montana or to Africa, you know, all of a sudden you have a platform by which you can do this. So the reason I bring that up is there are projects that will succeed. Uh, you know, Lockheed's working on a project right now for uh, the Air Force for a high altitude uh, solution. Uh, for security purposes, so a, a spy satellite on a blimp. And that project has a budget of $100 million. And that project will probably complete you know, in the 2015 timeframe. And I'm absolutely convinced that they will succeed. I mean, it's been tried before, but this time it will succeed because the technology is there. But they're not going to produce a vehicle that cities can buy. And that's what we're doing that's different. These are just other views. Um, you know, one, I just want to say, you know, you know, there's areas for equipment, but more importantly, this one, because if any of you have uh, worked on balloons, it's a semi-dirigible balloon, basically. It's not a complete rigid structure, um, but you have to have enough rigidity uh, in the vehicle to be able to anchor certain points. Uh, but you also have to provide enough flexure so as you go through uh, different z zones of instability as you go up through the jet stream that you don't break, effectively you don't break your corners, right? Because it's, it's going to have to flex and give uh, the all. Oh. Did anyone else have any questions on the shape or, or structure of the balloon? In the balloon? Why is there a hole in the middle? Ah, you walked away that part. I already covered that. <laughs> Um, you know, the elevators may or may not be there. They, they're simply there to help uh, control pitch a little bit. 
the 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 amount of control surface there is not is not significant. Uh, so it becomes a question at low altitude whether it makes sense to have them or not. Th those are meant more for the low altitude stuff and not the high altitude. Um, but specifically how this is different than a lot of other airships is other airships tend to be long and narrow. Um, you know, they're trying, you know, all airships are trying to reduce the amount of surface area in the front uh, and increase the amount of volume. Um, two things about this ship is it's built specifically to be able to pitch up at a very high angle uh, and be stable. There's a lot of baffling there, which you're not going to see, uh, to help make that possible. That's very important for cutting through the jet stream and other areas of instability as fast as possible. Um, and then the second is it does have a fair amount of roll stability uh, in comparison to other vehicles. Uh, again, that's to help it survive uh, you know, controllably through some of these regions. And then also as you're looking at different uses of it, the, stabi the roll stability becomes an issue. I'm, I'm seeing a question, sort of. No? How will it be used? So the applications for this product are pretty, pretty easy to articulate. And there's probably more up here than, than I have. And pr certainly more probably in the heads around here than, than you know, that I have on one slide. Uh, some of the primary areas that we've had discussions with are around uh, disaster emergencies, right? Uh, if you have one of these vehicles up, and I'll give you some coverage circles as examples, you can provide communication services uh, within an area you know, to anyone who has access to it. Event use, so you know, disasters aren't the only reason you have temporary communication. Burning Man, Olympics, right? It's basically an alternative to a geosynchronous satellite in this mode. It's close to the Earth. You don't have the light time delays. You have better link margins. Uh, you have the ability to have it over any spot on the Earth. One of the things I didn't cover with geosynchronous satellites is they can only literally be over the equator. So with this, it can be over wherever you want it to be. The other is you can put, media, you can put protocols on there that operate traditionally closer to the Earth. You don't have to use just you know, the, sat you know, the typical satellite communications, KU band or other communications. You can put stuff that works terrestrially. Um, one caveat, you do have to use high gain antennas, so your coverage for that's a little bit different. Observation, again, staying consistent with my comparison to satellites. I put it second, but I will tell you right now, this is what's driving the market for these craft. It's not a surprise Lockheed has a $100 million contract for this. Uh, we're talking to, to customers um, about using this vehicle, and, and hopefully we close the customer in the next few months, um, about using this vehicle for persistent security. There's too many people have too many assets at risk that want to see if something, you know, if something's coming close to a pipeline, is coming close to a shipping channel, coming close to a port. Also, something I like to promote, because living in California, I get tired of this, um, it's a great platform for early warning fire detection. So even though we talk about observation from the standpoint of you know, spy satellites, Google Earth, uh, security. There's tremendous applications just like satellites. You have weather, you have Earth resource mapping, you have crop management. The same is true of this. And it's at a price which now the state of California could potentially use it to detect wildfires before they become an issue. Real-time traffic. I don't know if any of you use 511.org. Google. Google Maps. Google Maps. Um, one thing that would be nice is have a button and click, and you can see a video of traffic issues as they arise. 
There's no reason you couldn't do applications like that. Weather permitting. And of course, as I already harped on a lot, security. So I've been talking about abstract that you have a big coverage circle. This is the actual RF horizon of the vehicle at 60,000 feet. So any communication that you could do with a normal satellite today, you could do in that sort of covered circle. So let's say you wanted to roll out a competitor to Dish TV, to Direct TV, um, or you know you just wanted to provide um, Direct TV like satellite or um, internet access to parts of Nevada. You could now do that with a much cheaper vehicle. So you would have, certainly if you were looking at commercial aspects, you're looking at a big enough media market that you can actually you know, make money on this. Uh, or if you're looking at, a, you know, as a government, and you're looking, is there enough service that you can provide to justify the cost? There are. There are. This is one that's actually a little bit, I think, more important. So if you look at high gain coverage, so I assumed a five degree antenna, which would give you enough link margin, enough power, radiated power, that you could use things like WiMAX, you could use self, you know, you could provide cell coverage. That's the covered circle. Now that covered circle could move anywhere in that other circle, right? You, you can choose where it's at. But if you were pointing at the Bay Area, that's what you could cover, or a little bit easier to see. That's the sort of range that you could cover. So imagine you have an earthquake. You could have your cell phone antenna up there. Anyone with a cell phone could text for help that's in that circle. No one has to be left unfound if they have a cell phone or they have some other way to communicate to you. You also, as an emergency measure, could use things like cell phones and other communication technology to deliver a message to everyone. Examples from Katrina where the emergency workers couldn't get messages to people to tell them where to go. You could do it. There's no reason any large city shouldn't do this. The other nice thing about the airships, other than being able to be permanently over an area, is they're mobile. So one, one of the potential discussions we had with Homeland Security was the fact that how long would it take you if you stationed a few airships over the US to get from point A to point B? If you had an airship you know, based on the west coast over the air, you'd want to do that for winds. <laughs> because the jet stream goes from west to east. You could be on the eastern seaboard within two days if you basically chose the correct flight. That's assuming you were at altitude. With basically three airships, you could cover the, U the contiguous U US within half a day. So the model here that I'm kind of hinting at is you have an airship up over the middle of the US and you know a hurricane is coming to a certain area, you could start to move it there. You don't have to have every municipality buy one of these for it to be an effective solution. So just to give you a little bit more reality of, of kind of the work that had been done, this was a proof of concept airship that our CTO, Dr. Alfred Differ, I've mentioned a couple times now. Uh, this is a 175 foot vehicle that had been built. Uh, as a test platform for the Air Force. The unfortunate thing is the Air Force had a requirement which cannot, as far as I can tell, be met by an airship, and that is they wanted rapid deployment. So they wanted to be able to, in, to deploy and inflate the vehicle and have it take off in the field. Uh, the one thing about an airship is they're big. 
there are lots of fabric. And what happened in the test flight of this is at launch time, a dust devil went right over it when it was not inflated. That was not very good. Uh, it basically destroyed the airship. You, you actually, I wish I had the video with me, but you get to see the, the streamer of the vehicle, the, the fabric, basically go up in a helical pattern. It's actually a pretty powerful dust devil. Um, people, you know, there were some people, fortunately no one got seriously hurt, but there were some people that, you know, because you have a lot of people uh, unfurling it, they weren't able to let go fast enough and they were actually falling a, a fair distance um, just in that time frame that it took them to mentally let go of the vehicle. So wind is, is a problem, particularly when you're not inflated. Once you're inflated, you're gonna move, right? And, and you have to make sure your vehicle can handle the stresses, but you're not gonna have that problem where it just kind of gets ripped apart. So if anyone tells you, you know, that they're gonna use an airship, make sure that they're going to inflate it in a hangar and then take off. Just, uh, the inflation will take a couple hours. Right? I mean, you're, you're pumping a lot of helium in it. it. There are ways to speed it up, but not, you know, there are limits. <laughs> um, but on, you know, on other flights that Al had worked on, uh, actually it's technically at 90,000 feet, but you know, 100,000 feet. This is over uh, Nevada. So, you know, this gives you an idea, and looking towards uh, the west coast. But this gives you an idea of the, the sort of view that you get from up there. Uh, eventually, of course, we'd love to be able to take people up and all that kind of stuff. But the primary uses of the product, as I mentioned, are unmanned. So how long does it take to get to altitude? Two hours. That, that's, that's the killer thing about being able to pitch and take off very quickly through the atmosphere. Um, you won't be able to do that with people. <laughs> But it, it takes off much like a, uh, a um, weather balloon would in terms of speed. So we, you know, it, it, as an airship, you don't want to mess around with being in the jet stream. It just, you know, unless it's going the way you want. Okay. So life is great. We, we, you know, we can build one of these off-the-shelf technology. Life is, you know, easy, right? I, I wish it was so. <laughs> um, I was asked earlier about the choice between helium and hydrogen for the vehicle. Uh, the first vehicles were, that we will build will be helium-based for a very practical reason. Uh, you know, although Hinden, the hydrogen was not the, responsible for the Hindenburg accident, hydrogen is very flammable, very explosive. Until we have really worked out the design in terms of static discharge and the sorts of environment we're going to, we're going to stick with helium. There's no reason to blow up a vehicle, even though it'd be unmanned, um, you know, to begin, to begin with. But the plan would be to move to hydrogen. Hydrogen through Mylar has a lower effusion rate. So one of the key problems with a balloon is holding the helium long enough to have a long duration flight. Um, and you know, the, the ways around that is you use thicker mylar, which of course makes the balloon heavier, you can't lift as much. Uh, you, uh, you know, make sure it's well sealed, you bring up liquid helium so you can pump into it, uh, which isn't really an option for hydrogen because gaseous hydrogen's not too bad to deal with, liquid hydrogen, no. <laughs> What about water? Well, so you could potentially bring up water and electrolysize it. And it does, um, there are actually some groups that are working on that sort of thing. And that might be a good way to go uh, if you're going to go with hydrogen. Um, the the trade-off, though, if you're going to use liquid helium, just so you know, liquid helium or uh, water as hydrogen is one, the weight of it. But more importantly, um, the balloons that typically last the longest are those super pressurized balloons I told you about, which are fully sealed. So if you're going to have any system where you're going to insert helium into it or you're going to insert hydrogen into it, uh, you're, going to have, you're going to have to design something no one's done, which is a super pressurized balloon that's re, you know, that you can actually put material into, you can put the gas into. So why not put the uh, liquid helium inside the balloon? Well, then, then you just have to have a way to control it, but you could do that. 
I mean, that might be a way to do it. And you might be able to do the same thing with the electrolysis. Um, but you're still going to have to design something which is this balloon which can f support that, right? Because you'd actually be having mass on the, the structure of the balloon, where right now they're built to be in an envelope and the, the uh, stresses are put going down. Although it's, it's an interesting idea. And I, it's not one that I necessarily know has been explored. Yeah, well, you can make more ozone. I think we need some. So, um, other challenges: the the day-night cycle. Uh, if you don't go with a super pressurized balloon, if you have free free floating balloons, which are easier to build and cheaper to build, they will um, they will become denser when they get cold, and they will become a lot more buoyant when they uh, they warm up because they're going to warm up more than the surrounding air. So it's not like you'll stay with the air you're in. You'll actually move between zones. And it's actually not so much that you would move. The issue is that it puts you in this threat where you could move into zones of too much wind. Because especially if you're looking at communication or other things, if you're looking relatively straight up or straight down, vertical motion's almost you know, insignificant. So you could you could literally move a few kilometers and not affect your uh, your your mission. The other issue, uh, which has been an it has been an issue, is generating enough power, or more accurately, generating enough power without using so much mass. So, you know, and the power you're going to use up there traditionally is going to be solar cell. That's been true for quite a while. Um, I do, I do have people every so often that want to use wind power, but if you ever find out a way to do that that's not a perpetual motion machine, let me know. Um, and then the other issue I put up here. Yeah, well, there are, you know, you could probably come up with ways where if you use different uh, levels that you could do that. There are actually interesting propulsion techniques where people are using kites for both ships and you could use for airships. So you drop a kite into the jet stream at the altitude you want and you pull along. Uh, so that, that's definitely for motive power is very good. The nice thing is, is if you generate enough power to move, which we have to do, we have so much power up there for the payload for the observation satellite. Yeah, I, I remember having a discussion, because we're talking about a 400 kilogram payload, which is a pretty big payload uh, for an observation uh, package. And they were asking me how much power could they have. And so I was running through and it's like, okay, if you're assuming the steady state, on average you could have 10 kilowatt hours per day. And they're like, <laughs> it's like, well, if we didn't have that much power, we couldn't move with, with the winds you know, peaking at 20 knots. Now, I kind of put this in a technical challenge slide, but a key thing that has actually kind of kept things from going is the markets out there, the, the people that would be buying products, or, or sorry, funding products, developing products, don't want to take technical risks. This has been true since the dot-com boom, or dot-com bust, rather. Um, there's been this movement of the market to say, if it's a technical risk, don't fund it. Uh, I, I find that to be frustrating to some degree, because as you look at the dot-com boom, although there are people that took stupid technical risks, largely the failures were companies that VC took too much market risk. But you know, there's been a way moving back. If you've talked to any VC out there, and I've talked to a few, uh, no one wants to fund any technical risk. That's changing. So why now? Well, one is clearly new materials. If, if anyone's been following companies like NanoSolar and, and the companies like that, and uh, various nanotech uh, products, so making carbon fiber and all these things, you'd be able to make structures lighter that are very strong. That's part of what makes this possible. And specifically, solar power development. Because the weight of the solar panels is the heaviest thing on the vehicle. So the, the two key things, one is the, the whole printable, printable solar cell and before that, the amorphous solar cells that you could potentially bind to canvas rather than having to use metallic substrates. 
So these are things that suddenly made something that had been effectively a, a bit of a dream, and it's why I know Lockheed will be successful. These things have changed, and now you know those barriers are gone. And importantly, also Lockheed's a good example. It's persistent security is now spurring the, the, the market. There is no persistent security solution. There is no magic 24 satellite that sits there and gives you the ability to watch a car that's driving towards your, uh, your refinery, right? Since there's such a hunger for security solutions, people are willing to fund the technical risks that they weren't before. And we're, we're a beneficiary of that, and there will be others, and there needs to be others. This space needs to be funded. People need to develop products in this area that will benefit us. If you're ever going to work with a company or anyone else in any new technology, make sure that they have the practical experience. This is an example of a flight that Al worked on that was successful. It was very simple. One of the balloon cells popped. And that's actually the picture of the excess, uh, the redundant balloon cell, fortunately, uh, that ended up in the, the frame of the camera. You know, you're dealing with stuff going up at very high altitudes. You, you know, you're going to have to have the ability to understand what kind of failures are going to happen. So that's it for, for the talk, you know, that I kind of put up here. Um, but are there more questions out there? Which do you think will succeed if getting commercialized first? So this or heavier than the air, uh, airplanes flying at the same altitude, but kind of like Helios? OK, so, so the question was, will this succeed or sooner, or will um, UA, heavier than air UAVs, such as Helios, it's solar powered, um, succeed? And the answer is right now, air, airships have the advantage because, one, they take up a lot more power with them. right? So Helios has to use its power to stay aloft, where we're already aloft. The other, right now, I can have one controller, in terms of an unmanned airship, control a fleet. Where with Helios and other unmanned uh, UAVs, the cost of the UAVs is dirt cheap, right, in comparison to this sort of stuff. I mean, you, you can get UAVs potentially down to a quarter million. The problem is the cheapest UAVs to fly right now are $600 to $1,000 per flight hour. And if you're doing a two, 24 by 7, 365 day your security application, it's a no-brainer. So, well, that, that's the question. Is will they build the, the software and stuff that will allow them to, to hover well enough? But I, the, the, that won't get them over the power. Um, and then the other, the other issue right now is the Helios is still not a permanent flight. I mean, eventually they will. But when they get to that, they'll, they'll still need most of that power for the vehicle, not for the payload. So you need to be able to get up at altitude, stay over a fixed point, pretty much, and then provide enough power and control for the payload that you, you, know, you have. It. So it's, airships just a more natural uh, fit for that. And as the price comes down on airships, then why would you do it? Because eventually, I'll, I'll be able to get airships, I'm convinced, down to you know, a million to a couple million for a vehicle. So. But it's you know it's the reason I, it should so be competitive. For staying in the same place, you need to, is it like an electric fan type thing? That's yeah, it's a high altitude. It's it's funny you brought up you know Helios. It's it's using a high altitude prop um, with electric with electric motors. The funny thing is you don't want to turn the prop very fast anyhow because it's 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 very long and you don't want to exceed the the sound barrier at the tips, which is very easy to do because the speed of sound drops at those altitudes as well. But yeah, so to, to stay on station, you're using electrical power, electrical motors with special uh, double helical uh, props to, to drive the low, low density air. So what's the worst weather you can take off and uh, recover in? So in terms of on the ground, 
you know, for normal operations, we would target five to ten knot winds, or under under ten knot winds, and try to try to keep it under five. Uh, it's really a question of the risk that you're willing to take with damaging the vehicle and, and stuff around it. So in emergency situations, you're going to come down, right? And, and you're just going to you're going to deal with those risks. Um, you know, I would start to get nervous if you start getting 20 knot winds and you start getting gusts. Gusts are actually the bigger thing. As you get close to you know any structure and you get a gust, you're potentially going to run into it. That's the nature of the risk. Um, but uh, you know, the nice thing is if you think about where you put the the hangar, because you'll you know you fly the vehicle, you know, to and from a location. Um, and you'll typically go on station a couple days. One thing I didn't talk about, a, a funny thing about the one of the limitations is also somewhat of a benefit, and that is you have, I mean, we'd like the flight duration to be six months, and you're having a three-month duration. Um, it, it, longer would be better. The longer the duration, there's no doubt it's better. But it's actually advantageous that you cycle the vehicles because you will be able to upgrade the payload. You will be able to update the payload. You'll be able to repair the payload. So even if, if let's say we had a flight time of five years, I'm absolutely convinced that customers would be bringing things down every probably year or two anyhow to, up, to upgrade equipment. So you know, at some point, you get to a natural crossover point for the duration. So you managed to go a whole hour. Uh, but the final question I actually had was the size of the vehicle. Maybe I missed that. But how long, so that, that oh. prototype was 175 feet long? That, that was 175 foot. That was a two-thirds scale prototype for that project. The, the vehicle that we're looking at producing as an EOSAT um, is going to be a 50 meter vehicle. So 150 feet. That size. So about that size. Uh, for an unmanned vehicle. Uh, and if we do go to a manned vehicle, it'll be about 75 meters, so about 215 you know, feet. And how long is a 747? Uh, about the same size as the 75 meter vehicle. It has. <laughs> yeah, th this vehicle, sorry, th there was at one point, there's another vehicle. Um, as I said, we, we originally started as a, a space. Uh, Acquisition. So there's another vehicle that was designed, which is a hybrid airship rocket that would actually go from 60,000 feet to orbit. Um, that you know we've we've kind of cycled back away from that, but that vehicle would be much much larger. So. How big was the You know, I, I forgot to look that up, but it's I think it's about 400 feet long. Um, yeah. So we're our vehicle is about 215 feet long, but about also 215 feet wide. We're much wider because of the, the pitch uh, stability. So the Hindenburg was 400 by probably 100 feet, something like that. I apologize for not having that, because I knew I would get asked that, especially here. Google it. Google it, yeah. We're here. Anything else? To get down the cash uh, release, some of your uh, gas? No, we, we, we use ballast to come down. So you basically just pump more and more of uh, mainly ozone <laughs> into the vehicle. Uh, but you, know, you, you, you pump air into, into the cells, use the pressure, and, and lower, lower the vehicle down. Uh, we definitely don't want to lose any helium if we don't have to. <laughs> OK. Well, thank you much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to give me a holler. Well, thanks very much, Jeff. Thanks.